the duo back together to recap the draft and Mitch Kupchak's post-draft presser. What did he have to say? We'll talk all about that on Locked On Hornets. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free. We're available anywhere you get your podcasts. That does include YouTube. There you can see Doug Branson. Find a sub stack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. And I'm Walker Mail. Catch me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. I'm also going to try to center myself here. A little <laughs> yeah. bit off. I mean, you're a little out of practice, I think. Your camera's all wonky. I Weird. mean, get it together, man. Come it's on, draft. Camera, right. It's post-draft week. Come on. I know it is post draft week. Are you are you happy that it's post draft week? Are are you happy for the content that comes in multitudes or are you happy to just be completely over it because boy, I don't think we'll ever have a draft like that again and if we do then it won't be for a while. I'm happy that we can finally move on. We can start talking about the pick that the Hornets made and not the pick that the Hornets are going to make. I'm always shocked at this time of year, though, because we spend so much energy, so much talking around the draft. And then as soon as the draft is over, this happens to me every year. As soon as the draft's over, I'm like, holy heck, free yeah. agency is right around the corner. Summer League will be here next week. I mean, that's nuts. It, the, the summer league is always the one that weirds me out too, because these guys just got drafted into in, onto the team. And now it's two weeks later, not even they're going to be suiting up for their first game. We'll talk about summer league. We'll talk about free agency. There's still plenty of time to get to that. that. That will all happen at the end of the week and going into next week. But right now there's still some draft things to clean up, including Mitch Kupchak's presser. No, not just the post draft presser, like right after they made the pick. I know Doug's already talked about that. We have the audio there. Maybe we can kind of sprinkle that in throughout this offseason. But we do have the actual press conference. Mitch Kupchak, Brandon Miller, and Nick Smith Jr. had when they spoke at Spectrum Center the next day. Now, travel reasons are why James Najee and also Amari Bailey were not there. You have to think it's crazy, right? Amari Bailey gets drafted close to midnight because he was the last pick for the Hornets. And then, boom, right away, you got to hop in a plane to get to the press conference by 2 p.m. in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's why Bailey wasn't there. And then James Najee also has to do the whole, you know, he plays for a team right now. We do expect him to come no overseas excuse. and not to, <laughs> not the draft stash thing. Uh, we I, I expect him to be back. I don't expect him to be stashed, but we can talk about that a little bit later on. I want to hear your comments on Brandon Miller. Are you comforted about Brandon Miller based off what Mitch Kupchak had to say and anything noteworthy there from the GM on the second overall pick, Doug? I mean, it seems like they they came to a decision that was maybe the favorite all along. Maybe there was some debate. I mean, that's what I'm confused most about. Was he the favorite all along, or was there serious debate, or was it both? I mean, it just it seems like their messaging uh, was a little wishy washy on that. And I don't think you can have it both ways. Either he was the favorite all along, and then you just made the pick. Maybe you were just kind of looking at Scoot, uh, but but you really wanted Miller to be the pick, or there was serious, intense debate that happened. Uh, behind the scenes. I believe that there was serious, intense debate behind the scenes. Um, and <laughs> I like in the press conference that Kupchak had with Miller next to him, not not the ones that he did right after the draft, but the ones they did the next day with Miller and Nick Smith Jr. right next to them. And Kupchak managed to like insult both of them at the same time. He said, obviously, the number two pick, there was a lot of debate. It wasn't the easiest decision. And then, <laughs> yeah. and then I mean, he it's went true. On, like, it's, yeah. it's true. But then he went on to say, people aren't really concerned with who might go 22, who might go 28. And of course, Nick Smith Jr. was selected number 27 <laughs> hey nick um, so <laughs> look messaging has has not been this organization's strong suit um but look they got their guy and brandon miller is going to be the guy and i think you can already see hornets fans feeling better just by virtue of the fact that the hornets picked a player you know you we were polling before this pick and a lot of folks wanted scoot but now you can see i've seen some other polls on si that fans are already moving and saying, all right, we got to support the guy. They made the pick, they made the selection, and now we have to hope mm -hmm. that Brandon Miller, these off-the-court issues aren't really an issue. The organization said they investigated it. <laughs> they were they were comforted by it, I guess. Um, and so, you know, now we just have to hope that, that this guy's the real deal. Yeah, my takeaway from Mitch Kupchak is still, it's pretty... <laughs> 
damn unclear this process is for them. I mean, Mitch Kupchak is trying to tell us, and yet I still am not clear on, on what's going on because I think Mitch, I think what he's trying to say. Again, I can't emphasize well, enough. I, you, that before, I think. before you before you interpret, I do have this was uh, courtesy of David Newton um, had the, the good audio and the video <laughs> here of Mitch Kupchak's comment yeah. when they asked him. Yeah. You know, what made them comfortable enough to draft Brandon Miller despite his involvement in that incident at Alabama? So if you want, we can take a listen to that. Yeah, yeah, we can. Let's go ahead and listen to David Newton, Carolina Panthers beat writer covering for the Hornets during this draft process, tweeting out this video of Mitch Kupchak uh, saying a lot of nothing. Well, everything that we, you know, every answer they got, we got to every every question. Um you know, I, I would say, you know, he, he is a freshman, right? So, you know, he's a little bit, you know, I would say younger than, um, see, I wouldn't say younger. Nah, I bet not even go, go in that direction, actually. I'll just back off. <laughs> uh, clear, uh, clear enough? Enough said? <laughs> yeah. Um, he is a freshman. We do know that um, he's an older yeah, when, freshman. He's 20 years old. I know. I know. I know that was even for Mitch Kupchak. That was just, uh, yeah, you couldn't tell anything what was going on with Mitch Kupchak having that. Um, I was going to say, but what I was going to say about some of the messaging on this is, is what I think Mitch Kupchak was trying to say about the final decision stuff, whether it's him or Michael Jordan is that Michael Jordan has final say. And he gives that final say to Mitch Kupchak. I think that's how I interpret it. But here's what I'm not going to miss, Doug. Assuming that Mitch Kupchak is no longer the GM once new ownership takes over. I feel decent about that. We had that conversation even before Michael Jordan sold majority stake. That Mitch Kupchak himself might leave, right? Like, he is somebody that's older. He wanted to go. It's not that he would get fired. It's that he would go into a different role. That was something that might happen with Mitch. So I don't expect him to be the GM once Gabe Plotkin and Rick Schnall decide who their GM is going to be. I don't think it'll be Mitch. What I'm not going to miss is the constant interpretation, us trying to interpret who is making the pick between Mitch and Michael, and also Mitch having pretty bad messaging over the years. And I actually feel like I've defended Mitch in some of those pressers, but this one wasn't great Th these comments i actually think wednesday doug surprisingly we were all expecting a disaster wednesday before the draft i actually think until we had to have the whole who has final decision conversation i actually think wednesday he was doing pretty good i thought oh okay these are fine answers i was like wait is mitch actually doing a good job here and then we got the unclarity I i'm just you know i'm ready to have a new gm new ownership and a storyline revolving around Michael and Mitch, who's making the final pick. It will be nice to not have that a part of the discourse anymore. I think that will help us a lot as we move forward. It's weird when I feel better by the comments of 20 year old Brandon Miller, and we can talk more about those comments in yeah. the next few segments, but I feel more comforted by his comments. And I've seen other fans feel the same way. They say, Hey, this kid's saying all the right things. That's good. I feel more comforted by his comments than the people running the organization. And, and I think some of that not having clarity and not being able to sell a pick or a player to an or, to the fan base, I think it's, that's part of the reason you got the reaction that you got from Crown Club, from the Spectrum Center, which, again, another funny moment from the press conference. They asked uh, Kupchak about that. They said, you yeah. know, there's there's been a pretty negative reaction in Spectrum set, or in the arena, and he replied, "Which arena?" <laughs> <laughs> like what, Mitch? Spectrum yeah. Center, the arena that you are currently residing in, the one that you work in, the one where your office is. That's the arena where the pit got booed, uh, and and apparently Hugo did wasn't a huge fan either. Oh no! But, yeah. but I'll yeah. say this: I don't need to interpret. I know who made this pick. And I know it wasn't Mitch Kupchak. I don't. I think Kupchak was fully on the scoot wagon, and I'll tell you why. Coming up. <laughs> okay. All right. There you go. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Doug does his best to try to interpret what Mitch Kupchak was saying and really just what the Hornets were doing, and he thinks he was fully on the scoot wagon. Before we get to that, I do want to talk to you about eBay Motors. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. 
for a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to the My Garage tab and look for the green check to know the part will fit or you get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, get the right fit, get the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. More Locked On Hornets coming up next. Is Locked On Hornets. But I have seen him go all That's the way up to number 10. That was, is there a warning? Do we I need to get trying, out of here? Okay, here's the thing. My, I don't know if you heard, but my watch went off, and I was trying to silence it, and then I accidentally hit ping the phone, and then the phone pinged, and, and now here we are. <laughs> I'm doing my best, man. It seems like you're doing your very worst. <laughs> well, sometimes... It seems like you're. I'm actively fighting you today to move to Sometimes move smoothly. my best is my worst. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. Doug, you teased with you are sure that Michael Jordan was the one making this selection. How are you sure of that based off of Mitch's comment? Well, I've been sure all along. It wasn't just Mitch's Kupchak's comments that convinced me. I've been sure all along that Michael Jordan was going to make this pick because it is his legacy pick. It's the last opportunity for him to have full control of a process that in the past he has taken full control over. Not every draft, but in the past he has taken full control, and I think he did here and selected Brandon Miller. I watched the video of the call between Michael Jordan and Brandon Miller. They were cutting it up. They got little inside jokes about palming the ball. Um, I think this is who Michael Jordan wanted to pick. And mm-hmm. I think based on Cup Shack's, I think, wiffle waffling in the uh, in the post draft conferences about whether he was the favorite all along or there was intense debate, just the way he says there was intense debate. I just really feel like Cup Shack, who was at multiple games for Scoot Henderson, he was also at the 41 point game against South Carolina for Brandon Miller. But but he admitted that he has watched multiple games in person for Scoot Henderson. I really feel like he was advocating for that player. And they they ended up going Brandon Miller. This was this was MJ's pick. I'm not sure about a lot of things in this world, Walker. You could call me uh, skeptical, Doug, if you want. Um, I try not to veer off into conspiracy land too often, but I am a very skeptical person. I, I have a lot of questions that I ask on this show. I don't know how many answers I have, but mm-hmm. I ask a lot of questions on this show. But I'm sure of two things. Number one, that Cupcheck was on the scoot wagon. And number two, Shams has a Cayman Islands account full of suitcases, reams of money from FanDuel (laughs) because that tweet was fan base fraud. I don't know how many years I got to contact the DOJ. You know, I got to get I got to get with the government here because I don't know how many years you can get for committing fan base fraud. Uh, but something fishy. You know, I've been all over this thing. I had, I had my eyes on Kunkel. I had my eyes on Phony Gavoni. I had my eyes on Kevin O'Conn, man, Wacky Woj. And I missed the 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 fox in the hen house that was right there in the name. Shams. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shams c- yeah. committed fan base fraud. It was tough. It was tough to see those odds go to minus 700. I think it even got to minus 900. I was like, okay, wait, are we are we talking overwhelming favorite at some point? And then that thing starts coming right on back down, closer to Brandon Miller land, where it's like, wait, okay, this is this is going to be the pick at number two. About the Mitch Kupchak messaging, I will say he was waffling a lot more this year than he ever has with some of these draft picks where we can talk about the messaging from Mitch. It's never been a huge strong suit for him, but we can go to last year where you and I had a problem with trading the 13th overall selection and moving back to where the highest pick you were going to have then was 27. And it was always going to be late because the Denver Nuggets were good. And anybody could see, even if you didn't have them winning the championship, you could see they're going to get Jamal Murray back. Even if he's hurt, the Denver Nuggets are a playoff team, right? Even if their second best player is hurt. So, It was always going to be a later draft pick. That was the problem we had. But Mitch's reasoning for that, while we disagreed with it big time, there wasn't any waffling on it. He didn't want younger players on a team going for the postseason, and that's why they moved the pick, and so they wanted to have more room for veteran minutes. Okay, clear message, 
very much disagree on the actual move you made there, but clear message. I haven't heard this, this lack of clarity, Doug, despite us always having some problem with Mitch, uh, Mitch Kupchak's messaging. Uh, it's this one was the worst this, this is entire time. And so that's because, yeah, I'm with you. Like there, there's a very good argument to be made that, you know what? Maybe he did want skewed and they went with Brandon Miller. And there were a lot of people that like Brandon Miller over skewed and Michael Jordan was one of them apparently. And the Charlotte Hornets eventually as an organization who has to adopt the opinion of the highest member in that hierarchy, they all have to adopt it. And so apparently they like Brandon Miller a little more as well. Yeah. It was their final call. It was their final opportunity to ignore uh, the fan base's desire. And all we can do now, this is the sickness. This is part of being a sicko is knowing that you ultimately have to deal with a fan, a, a, an organization that doesn't care what you think, and you ultimately have to support whatever decision they make. And, and that's, I think, where a lot of the fans are now. Look, this is Brandon Miller is an elite shooter, has the length, has the lateral quickness to defend multiple positions. This is a guy that if he puts on strength, if he reaches his ceiling, uh, could absolutely uh, be better than Scoot Henderson when all of this is said and done. It, it, we thought it was riskier uh, than Scoot, uh, but here we are. And now we've got Summer League coming up. Brandon seems like he's going to play. Wimby seems like he's going to play. Scoot's going to play. It's a surprise, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's going to be exciting. And and I think we should talk about it this overall draft hall as well because they made a lot of picks. You know, contrary to last season uh, where they were looking to ditch picks, because of all of the uh, veteran, you know, minutes that they needed to get this year, they took a lot of players. What do you think, Nick Smith Jr. at twenty-seven? Well, yeah, I I do think Nick Smith Jr. is a, a great selection. I I love what the Hornets did. I clearly wanted Scoot Henderson at number two. I love what they did at twenty-seven, taking a high-risk guy. Not even a high-risk guy. That's not, that's not true. Just taking a high up upside guy with Nick Smith Jr. Watching him come in after being a top three overall prospect coming out of high school. And then even last year where the shooting percentage, it was down the overall field goal percentage, the efficiency, it was down. We know that he suffered through a lot of injuries last year, especially on the rise of Anthony black, who is someone that was fantastic in the backcourt. So you're trying to come in, find your rhythm with guys that are already establishing their rhythm, even with the Jordan Walls, who was drafted in the second round, Anthony Black mm -hmm. at number six, it's going to be hard. I, I love what they had in, in Nick Smith Jr. right there at 27, and it seems like he really wants it too. So that's fantastic. Love that pick. And I'll tell you this real quickly. My favorite uh -huh. selection of the entire draft is James Najee. Ooh. Doug, I love him. Uh, this is going to be one of my guys. I'm just telling you. Uh, I we'll, we'll see how he's able to translate. Offensively, very raw. But I think it's wrong to call him overall a raw prospect. I don't okay. think he's raw defensively. I don't think that at all. If you watch him, Doug, I think he makes very good reads right now. I think his positioning in the post is already very good. I think he makes up ground. I mean, in the blink of an eye for somebody at seven feet, 250 pounds to watch him get as low as he does in defensive position on the perimeter being able to stay in front of guards, certainly long enough to then retreat back into post land and then contest at the rim. Mm -hmm. Nasty. We know mm -hmm. that he's got a lot of physicality that he brings to the table. Mm -hmm. Offensively, it's going to be a lot of dunks, a lot of roll man stuff. And maybe every once in a while, he'll put a shot up over his left shoulder. Maybe. But defensively, Doug, I don't think he's raw. He's my favorite pick. And I'll tell you this. I do think... I think right away you're going to see him have a defensive impact that competes with Nick Richards. I, I, I'm very interested to see that battle. You know, may, maybe that's a little too far fetched, but it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if you don't see him at all this year. I mean, I could still see that yeah, player be, true, too, being you know? a draft and stash kind of thing. And and Mitch Kupchak telegraphed that a little bit. If he's still the man in charge when all of those decisions get made then I can definitely see Najee remaining with Barcelona or whatever international team he moves to off of that, remaining there until the Hornets uh, feel like they they need that. Now, th depth-wise, they could stand to have another center, but do they mm -hmm. go out and find that in free agency or via trade, or do they you know, depend on Najee? I think that's an open question. Back to Nick Smith Jr., every pick in the first round 
for, for the past few years has, has been even more of a crapshoot than it was because now you're drafting 18, 19, 20-year-olds and you just don't know how they're going to develop for another three to five years. So every one of these picks is a risk. But I think particularly Nick Smith Jr. because you are betting on the high school tape. And there were several guys that that was the story. Hey, you got to understand what this guy did in high school because of this situation in college and this situation and this context. But that's Nick Smith Jr. You are betting on, hey, look at that high school tape because the freshman stats, it's not just the shooting percentages. It's the decision making. Like if you look on his tankathon uh, page where they do pluses and minuses on stats, it's like all minuses because mm -hmm. that freshman year was an unmitigated disaster. There were games where he scored a lot of points. There's no doubt about it. He can pour it on. Uh, you know, he was a, a plus 20 point scorer in multiple games for, for the Razorbacks. But there are a lot of games where you go, wow, that was awful. And so they are really betting that Nick Smith Jr., A, that the injury is fully healed, which he says it is, that he's completely past it, and that he, you know, that, that high school tape is more indicative of his game, and he, you know, turns into a Tyrese Maxey uh, type of player pretty quickly, and that he is really committed to being, you know, that two-way player that they need at the, at the combo guard position that they haven't had in quite a while. So I'm excited by the idea, but overall, I look at the draft and I think Nick Smith Jr., Amari Bailey, another freshman uh, that, that came on late, and then Najee, which is just, I think, a big question mark. And I really wish the Hornets would have explored at least one option other than Miller, because it was Miller or Scoot. I put that over here in the corner. But one option with those other picks that was a little bit safer that you look at the player and go, this player can hang both size and skill-wise, can hang in the NBA right now, can slot in and get you know 15 minutes in this rotation. There were guys like that. I think Colby Jones was a name that the Hornets would have been in range to select, um, and they didn't. They opted to go with a lot more risk, a lot of guys that you're going to see in Greensboro more often than you're going to see in Charlotte for the next few years. And, and I'm just disappointed by that because I think the timeline for the Hornets needs to be accelerated, not – not, you know, put off for another four or five years. But that that's what this draft hall indicates is that they made picks for far in the future, not for this season or next. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting conversation to have about those last three picks, and we will this entire offseason. All right, one more segment to go. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. I asked Doug if he was comforted by Mitch Kupchak in his comments, but now centering, yeah, we're have still to do the centering camera. the camera. <laughs> well, you no, know, now when you, when you zoom out, I got to switch it. So I'm going to have to switch it right back again, get Cameraman. ready for that in the next segment. But Doug is also going to tell us why he's comforted by Brandon Miller's comments in the next segment. That's still here on locked on Hornets is locked on Hornets. Adam Silver had Ahmad Rashad up on stage and he used his phone to like body scan Ahmad Rashad. And then they like inserted a, a, like a digital version of Ahmad Rashad into the highlight. Wow. And so I'm looking at this and going, just fix my league pass. I don't want to be in a highlight. I would just like to actually watch the highlight without my application logging me out, freezing, dropping all of the time. Fix my league pass before you insert me in the game, please and thank you. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. Okay, almost got it right. I think that's, you know, pretty centering, decent. Centering, center, and bang. Kind of there. All right, um, let's go to your uh, <laughs> thoughts on Brandon Miller's comments, Doug. I know Mitch Kupchak still kind of hard to make of what the process was like based off what he had to say. But you were comforted by what Brandon Miller had to say up there on the podium. What did he say to you that stood out? Well, I think he's saying all the right things. And, and you can't take that for granted. Again, these are 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and they have every opportunity. As Brandon Miller, I think, kind of found out in the pre-draft process, you have a lot of opportunities to say silly things that people will either take out of context unfairly or fairly mm -hmm. evaluate you know, your uh, stance on the, the things that are going to make you successful in the NBA. And he's saying all the right things. He knows what he has to get better at. He's he's on the same page as the organization in that he has to get stronger and then he has to get better quickly. And so hopefully those words translate into action, that he's in the gym a lot this summer, um, that, he, that he's focused on getting ready to be an impact player sooner rather than, you know, taking a long-term approach on his own career. I hope he has that same confidence because, look – 
this offseason is going to be very interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think his place in the rotation is going to be different than it is now. I don't, you know, I think where we slot him in in the rotation right now, probably behind Terry Rozier to start the season, might not be where we slot him in the season in the rotation when the season begins because I think trading yeah. Terry Rozier is still a real possibility. They may be depending on uh, the duo that Miller keeps talking about with him and LaMelo at the one, two, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's, if that's, you know, your, your starting lineup moving into the season, because I think they're going to want to make this transition sooner rather than later. So yeah, he cleaned up his comments on the basketball goat. I think that was nice to see. Uh, After although, doubling down. Yeah. The, the third time's a charm on that. Yeah. Well, here's the quote. He said, I think I've made it clear these past few days that Paul George is my goat greatest of all time. I don't know that he made that clear, but now it's clear. He says, the goat of basketball is LeBron. Paul George is still my goat of basketball. Mike is definitely up there in his prime. Nah, I'm just playing. Definitely Mike is a goat of hmm. basketball. He said, a goat. I'll note that. He said, a goat, not the goat. Uh, because he does everything. We wear his shoes. Uh, he jumps from the free throw line. But like I've said before, Paul George is my goat. <laughs> so there you go. He cleaned it up, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there are the cleanup comments from Brandon. What do you I think? What do you, you think about these comments from Brad? Do you feel like he's, you know, as he's doing the rounds here, doing all the interviews that he's saying the right things? I think it's pretty clear that he wants to have a good relationship with the fans. That's something that's come out with Brandon. When he was asked about the booing and a sit down with your boy, Will Kunkel, we'll ask him about what he has to say to those fans that did boo him at the spectrum center. And it wasn't anything with malice from him. It wasn't, you know, screw them or anything like that. It was, I hope to be able to change their opinion. And that's, that's hard good. because I, I don't agree with booing, right? Like, that's not anything that I'm going to be about. I'm not going to boo these kids when they're drafted because, right. yeah, even if I wanted scoot, that's just, I, I've always thought booing was kind of lame, in my opinion. Now, anything. what do you think? Did you, now, what do you think about the idea that they were booing the organization, not booing Brandon Miller? Do you buy that at all? I mean, it's still Brandon's moment. I mean, you're, 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 you're not, you're booing as soon as Brandon Miller's name comes out of Adam Silver's mouth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not, you know, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if I look, you can be frustrated with the Charlotte Hornets for sure, but in there, whether it's 50% or whether it's a hundred percent, Brandon Miller is somebody that is a target. And that's where I have a problem with it too. I just am not, I just think it's kind of lame anyway, but yeah, especially when there is the 20 year old involved that that it's his moment and so i'm not i'm not aboard that by any stretch go ahead i, I agree i agree with you on principle but i kind of li secretly like not so secretly like the idea of him having to psychologically overcome something this early in his career because we're going to know we're whether this we're, it is a test it, it, we're going to know whether this is going to fuel him or whether this is going to get in his head and disrupt what would have been a normal process. Because look, the Charlotte Hornets just delivered a gigantic chip onto Scoot Henderson's uh, broad shoulders, okay? He's going to play his bleep off for Portland because he thinks he should have gone one, <laughs> you know, unrealistically, but, but he knows he should have gone two, okay? So we just gave him a big chip. And fans have now delivered a little bit of a chip on Brandon Miller's shoulder, but I agree with you. His comments were great because it shows maturity. But I hope secretly he goes back in the gym and is like, all right, bleep them. I'm going to show every single one of those bleepers mm -hmm. that booed what the bleep I can do. I, I liked, uh, <laughs> I think it's Israel on Twitter, who's a good Hornets follow, he tweeted out that um, all the, the, the booing video, he's like, this is going to be one hell of an intro to his mixtape. <laughs> like, it's great. This, this Brandon Miller video, it's going to be a hell of a mixtape. He's so right about that. They, they, the other thing you, know, you need to overcome these kinds of things. That's the whole thing. Your story should not be easy. Your story should not be easy. This is just one bump for him. And he's going to get, hopefully, if he's any good, if he's got a good system around him, he's going to quickly either ignore that or use it to fuel. Him. Um, the other thing is when I talk about him trying to build a good relationship with fans, he said a couple of times, Hey, don't hesitate to have a conversation with me. I actually find value in that. I do. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think he's not, he's already not trying to hide from anyone because it's not, he's in a situation, Doug, where there has been a lot of public backlash based off of what happened in the shooting of Jamia Harris. So yeah. You have that backlash. He's clearly not hiding from that in the public eye. I imagine that he's getting a lot of advice behind closed doors to not talk about it. There's probably some legal reasons as to why he can't talk about it. But the other thing is I got to see him 
discuss, um, just have some conversations with fans because after, so I was broadcasting live at the Spectrum Center while this was happening. Okay. So I was doing this on WFNZ and then mm-hmm. they give you the backdrop. And then Brandon and Nick, the only draft picks that were there, they were signing autographs. And there were a lot of people. The line was going pretty damn close to out the door. Yeah. And as soon as they finally, after the process is you know done, glad handing, talking with Mitch Kupchak, talking with reporters, whatever, they finally bring those guys over and they start signing autographs for a lot of the fans. And Brandon was talking nonstop with everybody. He was living it up. Granted, this is really early. This is all a fun process at this point autographs probably won't be fun for him later on but right now i think the first impression just based off what you're getting to see based on who you're getting to meet i think fans right now are are he's very welcoming and i think in return the fans are going to be welcoming because of this entire reaction that he's had to the process yeah i think it's part of the reason why you've seen this shift in in polling and fans going okay well i was you know super on the scoot wagon but the the scoot wagon took off without me and so now i'm going to go over here to miller land and and have move a good on time. man this is this is what you move have to on do miller. adapt or it's, die right it's move on miller time you know that's 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 what we're that's what we're mm-hmm. in right now but i'll agree with you that you know him coming out like this was important because we didn't get to see a lot of him in the pre-draft process uh, on purpose. You know, I, I think there was right. from from the organization standpoint, but also from from his team standpoint, like it was not going to benefit him to go out and talk about this this off the court stuff a lot. That was only going to hurt him if he said something stupid, both legally, <laughs> but also in the pre-draft process. And but I will give some advice to fans. If you do see Brandon Miller walking around trade and try on, don't I mean, don't open the conversation with. So what really happened at Alabama? Like, right. maybe just ask about basketball. But right. I think uh, Brandon Miller, it's a nice thought that he's going to be, you know, if he's walking around uptown or whatever and you come up to him, he's going to talk to you. I would if I just if I was in a private conversation with Brandon, I would say, keep your expectations low for that. Uh, because I think a lot of people in Charlotte are pretty chill about see, you know, it's not, this is not LA. This is not New York. This is not Chicago, even like big cities where like TMZ is running around all over the place. We have like one paparazzi Twitter account that like takes pictures of celebrities when every they're five town. months. <laughs> yeah. Like it doesn't happen a lot. So I think he's, pr- I think he could, you know, walk around Duckworths or whatever. And, and not a ton of people are going to like crush him, asking him for things. People are going to be like, you might get a few people will go oh that's brandon miller that's kind of neat and then everybody moves on with their day so i would just say keep your expectations low that might be good for you you don't have to deal with that extra stress Mm -hmm. um but if you're a fan you know and you see brandon miller you know dap him up ask him about basketball and let's you know let's get to summer league yeah i think it's good i think those comments were good from brandon it wasn't anything profound it wasn't anything extremely detailed but he's doing everything the right way at this point and that's and, all you can ask for from and a guy I that's think drafting. he seems goofy right like he seems, seems like fun. a kid he seems like yeah, a kid clowny and i think um he's gonna be a better interview he's gonna be a better uh quote than draft picks of the past and that's that can help your team when when you're one of your best players can be a little bit goofy like part of the fun of Muggsy, LJ, and Alonzo were that they were like media darlings. You know what I'm saying? Like they had good quotes. They were fun. They had they did commercials dressed as a grandma. Muggsy was fun. And Muggsy, you by the like way, this? boom, yeah, there you go. Grandma, grandma. grandma. And Muggsy is behind this Brandon Miller pick. So look, if you like the classic <laughs> Hornets, you, you've got an advocate in Muggsy Bogues. But they were out front and they were, well, maybe not Alonzo. Alonzo was a little bit, <laughs> Alonzo was a, a bit grisly. Alonzo was hostile almost. He was yeah. hostile, you're right. But, but two out of three ain't bad. And so yeah. that, I'm just saying, Brandon Miller being right. like this, being a little bit goofy, can if he's good, you know, the game has to back it all up. But if he's good, having that kind of personality, you know, around the team is a good thing. Well, LaMelo and Brandon as the personalities in the backcourt, that'll be a lot of fun. LaMelo seems to be on board. I mean, you know, guys that are high profile within this organization's past, present, and future uh, seem to be all aligned that this was was a good pick. So I I think everybody has to take that into account as well. All right, so we'll end it there. Um, The thing is with LaMelo, we haven't talked a lot about him outside of how he'll fit with this number two overall pick. We're going to change that tomorrow. So we appreciate you joining us tomorrow. We'll get to some more LaMelo conversation. Mitch Kupchak did have comments on big updates. who the leader could be. Ooh. Could the leader of this team be LaMelo, or do they still need that guy? That will be the lead topic for tomorrow. We'll also give you an injury update there. And then Wednesday, we'll also give you the free agency preview. Start to give you a primer at the end of the week. That's when things start to ramp up 
on free agency in the NBA. So still lots to come. Yes, it's post-draft season, but there's still lots of updates, lots of info. And so keep it locked in on Locked On Hornets right here on the YouTube channel as well. Locked On Hornets, just search it. Very easy to find. Thanks for making us your first listen. Make your second listen game to game NBA every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the league with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Just follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA. Available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Have a great rest of your day. We'll talk LaMelo tomorrow.